lot of people don't know this where money comes from and where the, the, the money that you handle and the money that you send to people in the banking system where did that money come from who created it a lot of people think that somehow the government created the money and then that gets distributed through the banking system in terms of salaries but that's not at all true in the year dot money was gold a gold coin you wanted a loaf of bread you buy a, you buy a loaf of bread with a gold coin and it's a bit inconvenient carrying all your gold around and so at some point people started depositing their gold in banks uh, or goldsmiths and the goldsmith would give them a receipt that said I owe you one gold coin and so the next day when you go to the baker's he said okay that will be a that's a, a gold coin for your loaf of bread and you go oh I've put all my gold coins in the bank but here's a receipt for a gold coin and the baker says that's fine thanks very much I've got a receipt for a gold coin it didn't take too long for the banks to realize that all the gold was now in their vaults and people were trading money with their bits of paper instead and so when anybody went to borrow some money went to borrow some gold coins the bank didn't go down to the vault and bring out some gold coins they just wrote on another piece of paper there you go 10 gold coins no problem and in that way the money supply grew because there's now far more bits of paper in circulation than there was gold to back it up so you can see instantly how money can be created in 1844 the bank of england attempted to take control of the money supply because until 1844 anybody could open a bank and anybody could print banknotes and whether or not you accepted the notes from my bank was a matter of whether you thought my bank would honour that when you came back to redeem them. Eventually the Bank of England took control of this and said enough is enough. From now on only the Bank of England can create can print banknotes and they thought that that would control the money supply. The bank simply just write on their deposit account, they'd give them a passbook, and they invented money in that way. And so in that way, the banks bypassed the attempt at controlling the money supply by creating new means of transferring IOUs. As everybody knows, if you increase the supply of money, but, with that, but you don't increase the supply of goods to spend that money on, that obviously leads to inflation. And that is why, in that same time frame, where uh, the money supply has quadrupled, house prices have trebled because the housing supply ain't going anywhere, but the money that's chasing that housing supply is growing exponentially. So so when money chases uh, something which isn't growing, that results in inflation. Till 1931, it was pegged to gold and it was limited by the amount of gold in the world. And until 1971, it was effectively pegged to gold because it was pegged to the dollar, which was pegged to gold. So it meant until 1971, money growth was pretty impossible. Uh, and then banking reform began to happen. Eventually in 1986 in Britain, we had what was called the Big Bang, in finan uh, the financial Big Bang, uh, where all restrictions on banking, capital flows, capital creation were wiped away by the Thatcher-Reagan administrations and you had unrestrained growth of the money supply and the money supply has quadrupled in the last 20-30 uh, years. Well that doesn't mean the government have printed four times more money, what well, that means that private banks have created money. So when you walk into a bank and say I'd like to borrow a million pounds to buy a house. They don't go down to the vault and bring a million pounds in gold coins out of the vault and see, say, there you go. They don't even give you a million pounds of used fibres. They simply just write it onto your, onto, your, onto your deposit account and say, there you go, you've got a million pounds in your account, go and spend it. Now, if you think a little bit about that, you wonder, okay, so, but eventually they have to hand that over, that million pounds over to some of these banks. When I go and buy a house off of you, then they would have to pay your bank. But this is where the magic really begins. Your bank is also doing the same trick. They are also just magicking a million pounds out of nowhere to blend to one of their customers to buy off of one of my bank's customers. As way back in the old days, the banks would come together at the end of the day. And why how we have the term clearing banks is to say, okay, so I've got 
um, a million pounds of your checks and you've got a million pounds, a million and one pounds of my checks, here's a pound, let's call it quits. And that's exactly what the banks do today. They never produce that million pounds, they just magicked out of nowhere. They just settle the difference at the end of each day. And in that way, the money supply has quadrupled in the last 30 years. I first became involved in financial services because I graduated in maths and computing. With a maths background, it's far more attractive and lucrative to move into finance. So, for anybody with a science background, it sucks the brains out of the rest of industry. It's, it's a hoover, the financial services industry. It drains everybody who could be doing useful things into doing what is essentially a non-productive industry, shuffling money around and helping the rich count their money faster. Productive industries are things which produce goods for the economy. Uh, the, 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 the financial industry isn't considered to be a productive economy because it doesn't produce anything for sale. It multiplies the amount of currency in circulation which essentially creates inflation and the proceeds of that inflation goes to the banking sector as profits which means they are sucking money out of the productive economy. Only 13% of all the new money that is created actually goes into the productive economy. As housing uh, accounts for between 20 and 50% of your income, uh, of your work effort, that means that people are working longer than ever before. And the banks have essentially, you're paying interest to the bank on something that never existed in the first place. So it represents a huge transfer of wealth from those who are working to those who just own capital. Every single transaction you make, you are paying money to people who own capital. Now the reason why a cup of coffee is so expensive, £2.40, so you think, okay, so the price of the raw material of a cup of coffee is maybe 20 pence, why am I paying £2.40? The answer is simple, because £1.50 of that is going in rent to the landowner who owns a coffee shop. Money supply goes up, it inflates property prices. When property prices go up, the price of your coffee goes up. It's that simple. If you want to be a player in your own life and taking control of the decisions, you should be thinking about there are people behind closed doors and open doors that you can have access to who are making decisions which affect the this fact that you have to work until 10 o'clock to pay your rent. I don't really think that global inequality or global justice is part of what is taught in economics at any level. There are two types of economics which are taught, two, two main types of economics which are taught at university anyway. One is um, uh, technical economics, mathematical economics, which discusses things like price elasticity and the mathematics of elasticity and supply and demand. And that type of economics does not consider justice or inequality. It simply is the mechanics of how an economy works. There's a different branch of economics which is about um, political economies, which looks at a bigger picture. What, what the impact on society will be. I suspect if you were to ask what you think of economics, it would also be tumbleweed. And which is a real shame because if you phrased the question, are you interested in politics, it'd be, are you interested in taking control of your life and taking part of the decisions which affect your life, then you'd go, yeah, of course I do. If you know about economics, you understand the news so much better. If you were to look at the news tonight and every story that's on the news, you would probably say, if I had a little bit of a handle on economics and political economics, I would understand and have an opinion on every story tonight. You would just get so much more out of and be so much more engaged with society because you would have an opinion. I think it's everybody's responsibility to educate themselves. Schools can maybe spark an interest, but there's no way that you can cover, there's no way that a school can cover any subject um, comprehensively. School does not have the time or resources to do that. And the same applies to politics and economics. So whose responsibility is it to make sure that 
that kid there knows how the economy works. I would say it's that kid there.